The Christadelphians present This is Your Bible, a program dedicated to the study of your Bible to learn about the wonderful future that God has planned for this earth. Join us now as we open up the Bible and reason together around God's Word. Welcome to another episode of This is Your Bible. Today we're going to ask the question, have you sinned? Has somebody sinned against you? Do you find yourself able to forgive those who have sinned against you? And can we be forgiven of our own sins? And if so, how do we do that? And moreover, can we forgive ourselves for those things we've done wrong? Today, we're going to take a look at the Bible and what it tells us about God's mercy and his forgiveness, which is found in Christ Jesus. And we'd like you to ask yourself that question, have I sinned and can I be forgiven? Because stay tuned, we'll be right back to take a look at it. I don't know what your idea of paradise is. We all have our own views on the subject, but I think that most would agree the scenes we are looking at could be described as a touch of paradise. The Creator made this earth a paradise originally, and then mankind spoiled it by trying to do things his own self-centered way. Mankind has ever since tried to create his own paradise, one in which man is glorified and the Creator is forgotten. All around us we can see grim reminders of the remoteness of paradise, reminders that man without God cannot bridge that distance to the true paradise. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, we're told that the original creation made by God was very good. We are also told that throughout the Bible that the world will be very good again when Jesus Christ returns to establish the kingdom of God on the earth. In Psalm 72 it says, He, Christ, shall deliver the needy when he cries, the poor also in him that has no helper. He will redeem their life from oppression and violence. In Isaiah 35, the desert shall rejoice and blossom as a rose. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb sing. And in the book of Revelation, there shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain. Sounds good, doesn't it? This is what the Bible has to say about the good things to come. You can learn more about the message of the Bible and your part in God's plan by signing up for our free online Bible courses at thisisyourbible.com. Just click on the Learn More tab and register for Exploring the Bible. Yes, the Bible does tell us that there will be a true paradise here, again, on earth, soon. Will you be ready? Welcome back to this episode of This Is Your Bible. Today we asked the question in the beginning, have you sinned? Has someone sinned against you? And are we able to forgive those who have sinned against us or forgive ourselves? Or how do we go about getting forgiveness for our own sins? The reality is we have all fallen short of the glory of God and we have all sinned. But the beauty is God's mercy and his plan for salvation for those who would search out his scriptures to find that hope which rests within God's mercy and forgiveness. We have a special guest with us today who is going to explore the issues of God's mercy and forgiveness of sins and that is Brother Joseph Palmer. It's Good to be with you, Steve. Pleasure to have you with us. And I want to thank you. You've come a great distance to be with us today. But we have a very interesting topic because I'm sure it concerns all of us. The reality is we've all sinned. And the fact is, what are we going to do? How do we get forgiveness of sin? Where can we go in Scripture to help us understand? Well, we have a fantastic template, Steve, for requesting forgiveness from God and the mercy of God in Psalm chapter 51. Okay, Psalm 51. If you'd like to turn there, the title to the psalm, Psalm 51, is actually part of the inspired version of God's grace. Now, it says, To the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone to Bathsheba. So it sets the context for us that this is talking about the time when David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. Now, what David says in verse 1 is a heartfelt request for mercy. You can read that as well. Psalm 51, 
and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Now, I had originally understood the word there, blot, to be talking about sort of ink and blotting paper that was used to stop it from spreading. And I'd been told that perhaps this was talking about stopping our sins from spreading and that the blotting paper was God stopping us from performing that act again. But actually, if you look at the meaning of blot, it's a bit more deep than that. And it's actually far more refreshing for us in a spiritual context. It actually means to abolish or to utterly wipe out. So what David's asking for is not for God to stop and to staunch the sins that he's committing, but actually to completely and utterly eradicate them, to actually free him of all of that. And that's taken up in verse 2, which corroborates this, when it says, wash me throughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Now, what you're talking about here is not just a, a, like a whitewash of some kind, but an actual removing of those sins so that they're not seen anymore at all. That's right. is, is that this is the the concept of blotting them out you're saying yeah but to blot out isn't just to like stop that sin from going any further it's actually to remove it utterly and so if it were on a page it would actually be abolished taken off you wouldn't see it at all so it's better than white out even it's not even like a covering like that where you could like scratch it and say oh wait there was something underneath there it's like a brand new page <laughs> a brand new page fresh and clean you know that reminds me of another passage that deals with God's mercy that's from Psalm 103 Maybe we should take a quick look at that. Psalm 103, reading verses, starting at verse 10. For he hath not dealt with, our, with us and our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For, his, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards us for them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. So... We could travel from north to south and eventually get back to being up in the north. But going from the east to the west, we continually to go round and round. We would never hit that part again. So it's talking about that same thing about our transgressions and our sins being forgiven, that they would never be remembered again. That's right. Yeah. And if you um, go back to Psalm 51, mm -hmm. you find that there's actually a sort of set way, if you like. This is a, a blueprint explaining mm -hmm. how we should petition God for that mercy and forgiveness. Okay. If we look at um, verse 3, for example, it says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Mm -hmm. So what David is telling us is that we need to acknowledge our sin, to come to God and to be forgiven. We need to tell him that we have done something wrong. And here he must have told God that, yes, he had sinned with adultery with Bathsheba. So what you're talking about here is confession. Mm -hmm. We have to confess our sins before God. That's right. And that that's a component of being able to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Well, what if we don't confess? If we don't confess, then that sin is hidden within you, and God can't really forgive you something if you're not asking for forgiveness on it. So in other words, if I don't think I've sinned, and I think I'm perfectly clean and fine and dandy, the fact of the matter is I can't be forgiven of that unless I actually become aware of it. <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, becoming aware of the sin is important. I have to be aware that the fact that what I'm doing is wrong. Yeah. Okay? Yeah, well, I think that's taken up again in verse 4 because it mm -hmm. sets out here an actual principle when we're asking God for forgiveness, telling him we've done something wrong. We're actually doing something which is a bit deeper than that. If we can read verse 4, it says, Against thee... This is God against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou justice, judgest. So what he's saying here is that God is actually justified when we acknowledge our sin before him. And so God is in the right and we are saying, yes, you're right and we are wrong. Well, in order for us to do that, we would have to know what our sin is confess it and have to acknowledge the fact that you're saying that God's way was the right way and that I failed to do that. Yeah. So yeah. that would mean that we'd also have to not have an understanding of what God's principles and teachings are. Which again is stating that this is the blueprint, if you like, for not getting mercy but requesting mercy from mm -hmm. God. And if you look at verse 4, 
there's some Bible echoes, if you like, that are in there. Mm -hmm. and it says that thou mightest be justified. Halfway through the verse, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest. Who's the thou? The, when it says that thou may be justified, who's being justified here? Well, that's God, isn't it? Oh, it's talking about God being justified. So where's the Bible echo? Well, the Bible echo from that is the God being justified is taken up, and you may have it in your margin, in Romans chapter 3. Okay, could we turn that up? Mm -hmm. Here we have the Apostle Paul writing to the Roman believers. And he quotes to them from verse 3 and 4 of Romans chapter 4, of Romans chapter 3. For what if some did not believe? Shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? God forbid. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. As it is written, that thou mightest be justified in thy sayings, and mightest overcome when thou art judged. So this is a direct quote from Psalm 51 when it says, as it is written. Yep, and when that happens, it's an invitation by God, if you like, to look at why is this being used? Why is he quoting from that? And verse 4, it also said, let God be true and every man a liar. Mm -hmm. So this is what we're actually saying when we're asking for forgiveness, is we're stating God is right, we are wrong, and that glorifies God. That takes a humble and contrite spirit to be able to confess in that way. Most of us don't like to admit that we're wrong, do we? Well, most of us, Steve, don't like to admit we've sinned. Yeah. And that's, I think, taken up in verse 23. In verse 23 is a very good point. In fact, it's the one that we quoted earlier in the beginning of the program. It says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we've all sinned. It's not like we may have done a bad sin or a not so bad sin. Every one of us has sinned every time we do anything which is against God's way, we've sinned. Every time we fail to do something we should have done for God, that's a sin. But what's wonderful about this is that we're justified freely by the grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. So the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ can heal us. Now that's taken up in verse 25, which again repeats what we looked at in verse 4, mm -hmm. which it said that we're declaring God to be right. He was justified. And verse 25 says, when whom God, this is talking about the Lord Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And then verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. And the righteousness again is that of God's. That's right. And this big word in verse 25, propitiation, what's that really all about? Well, this actually brings us back to Psalm 51 again, where David in Psalm 51 is asking for forgiveness, and he's asking for the mercy of God. And the propitiation is a word which we don't really use today, but is the word mercy seat. Ah. And so it's talking about the Old Testament ways of the law of Moses, and where you go to the mercy seat, or the high priest would go to the mercy seat and ask for an atonement to be brought closer to God. And wouldn't the high priest smear blood on the mercy seat? That's right, he sprinkled the blood of bulls and goats. Ah. And that's taken up there, isn't it, in verse 25, where it says, whom God hath set forth, so this is the Lord Jesus being set forth as this mercy seat. He is the way by which we're drawn to God through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness. But now, forgive me, because I'm not quite sure I'm following this, because the Lord Jesus Christ had not been born, nor had he existed before David sinned with Bathsheba. So how does he get forgiveness in all of this? Was it you know, only those people who sinned after the Lord Jesus Christ was born? <clears throat> no, those who had an understanding of what the Lord Jesus Christ's role was going to be, and David would be amongst those people, would be able to look at these passages in the Old Testament and draw conclusions from it. And we believe that David would have had the understanding about the Lord Jesus and his work and his role and the fact that he was going to be a sacrifice, and that that sacrifice, by the grace of God, is able to cleanse those before him and after him. I think that might have been picked up, I missed it, but the situation about sins, remission for sins in verse 25, for sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, mm -hmm. could that be possibly what you're talking about there? Yeah, I think you've picked it up there. Yeah. Ah, very good. So, if I understand this correctly, David was looking forward to the Messiah's coming, Whereas we look backwards in retrospect, mm -hmm. I think we got the better end of the deal. 
You know, it's <laughs> hindsight seems to be always 20-20. Mm -hmm. David really had to have a lot of faith to be looking forward and seeing those things. Mm -hmm. but, I think if we go back to um, Psalm 51, though, okay, we've got a very clear way in which David demonstrates that he has an understanding and grasp of this sort of New Testament, the New Covenant ideals. Mm -hmm. um, we'll start maybe go back into uh, verse 4, which we've looked at, mm -hmm. which is saying that God might be justified. And then in verse 6, it reads, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Now, I don't know what you make of that, Steve, but inward parts doesn't really convey a great deal to me. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look into it. You've got to get yourself a Strong's Concordance, some sort of Bible dictionary to find out what the original words were talking about. Now, the word inward parts is very interesting. Mm -hmm. It actually is referring to the kidneys. Really? Which is very strange, isn't it? And if you were to read that, it would say, Behold, thou desirest truth in the kidneys. Now, <laughs> that doesn't make any sense, does it? In, really in that doesn't. sort of ideal. Now, in a previous um, job, I worked as a meat inspector. Ah. And as a meat inspector, when you try and find the kidneys of an animal, they're right at the very back. If you were to look, this mm -hmm. area here would be the kidneys. And they're covered in fat right at the very back of the animal, protected mm -hmm. really well. And I think what is actually being told us here is thou desirest truth in the inward parts, in the kidneys, right in the most secret areas of your body, right in the areas where you might hide uh, a problem. And I think that's what David was doing. He was hiding a problem. And it's the most inmost thought God wants to cleanse. Well, now, it says here that he acknowledges his transgression and his sin. Did he not do that from the beginning? No, I don't think he did. And I think that's drawn out from uh, the original sort of writings in Samuel. If we were maybe turn to Samuel. Yes, let's do that. In the second book of Samuel. Okay. Chapter 11 deals with this issue where David commits adultery with Bathsheba. Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah, one of David's best fighting men. And David actually got rid of Uriah mm -hmm. by putting in him in the hottest battle, it says in verse 15. Well, why would he have done that? Well, he wanted to get rid of him so that he could marry Bathsheba. Oh, Bathsheba was Uriah's wife. Mm -hmm. There we go. And Bathsheba had actually fallen pregnant from David through their adultery. Oh, now I understand why he wanted to hide this. Yeah, and he'd actually hidden it for a while. And this comes across from verse 27. Well, try verse 26 and verse 27 of 2 Samuel chapter 11. It says that when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. So this is the lady that David had had adultery with. Mm -hmm. And then it says, And when the mourning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. So she comes back into David's house, and she now has a son. And then in chapter 12, the Lord God sends Nathan, a prophet, to mm -hmm. tell David what he has done and to bring him to repentance. Now, what we find in this in verse 14, for example, of 2 Samuel chapter 12, is that the baby was already born by the time that David repents. So that's at least nine months. Verse 14 of 2 Samuel 12 states, How be it because, and this is talking by Nathan, Nathan says, How be it because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. The child that is born unto thee. So the child had already been born, but David had not repented until this stage. And so when we go back into the psalm, Psalm 51, talking about these kidneys, if you like, in the most inmost thought, the most private and secretive areas of David's brain, he hadn't come to God and repented and acknowledged his sin. And so for nine months, maybe more, maybe a year, he'd been going to sacrifices, thanksgivings, and yet he wasn't able to give himself wholly to the Lord, and that had eaten him up. And it seems like, from the chapter, it seems like he'd actually got ill from it. Mm -hmm. He'd been retaining this thought, not expressing it to God, not really being thoroughly prayerful. And the wonderful thing about this psalm is saying that if you use these sort of blueprints to come to God to acknowledge the sin, that terrible pent-up guilt which was in David, it can be forgiven and it can be forgiven us. And that's a wonderful feeling to, to have that thorough cleansing. And that's what it talks about when it says, truly wash me 
And you can go back then to verse 1 and verse 2. And you can feel the emotion of David here as he, he realizes that for that long, he'd been cut off from truly being able to talk to the Lord God. He'd not been able to have a spiritual um, sort of discussion with God. Mm -hmm. He'd not been able to worship him properly. It had jeopardized their relationship. Exactly. So sin can separate us in our relationship with God. You know, there's an interesting passage in James 1 that ties in with this concept of sin, which really echoes to me what you read for us in the Samuel account about David and the conceiving of this child. In James chapter 1, it says in beginning of verse 13, it says, Let no man say that he is tempted when he is tempted, that I am tempted of God, for God tempteth no man, neither with evil tempteth he any man. Verse 14, it says, But every man temp is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. And when that lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And so there's this whole concept about sin being conceived in our life, like that child was conceived in the womb of Bathsheba, and it can grow in a way that can eventually separate us from God if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. But obviously David must have realized this. So his conversation with Nathan m made him aware that he had sinned. Yeah. And so even since that I've done a very long time ago that I was unaware that I had sinned, I can still be forgiven for? Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. I mean, all things that we draw to the Lord God can be forgiven from us. Um, I would, I've thought that there's going to be one or two sins which we just can't remember or we don't realize, and maybe that's due to our ignorance. And I would thought that maybe the Lord God can forgive those anyway. But I would have said that every week we need to be thinking and every day we need to be thinking about what we've done wrong, not so we can dwell on the past. And there's, there's a verse in Philippians which talks about looking to the future and not thinking about the past. Mm -hmm. Those things have gone. God's forgiven them. He doesn't even remember them. But we can go forward then and try and glorify God and tell people about the wonderful mercy that he has. So we need to forgive ourselves also. That's an amazing aspect of this because often, you know, we forgive those who sin against us, but forgiving myself, and that's a hard thing to do. But God doesn't work that way, does he? Mm -hmm. When he's forgiven us, he's blotted out. Just like you said, it's blotted out. It's gone forevermore. And you know what's interesting? Back in Psalm 51, mm -hmm. David had probably in those 12 months odd that he had been hiding this problem. He probably offered several sacrifices a day probably. And uh, what he says in verse 16 and 17 mm -hmm. is very interesting because this really draws us to the Lord Jesus. It says... In verse 16 of Psalm 51, For thou desirest not sacrifice. See, he offered all these sacrifices, but God didn't want those. Else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. A broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. And the broken spirit is something picked up by the Lord Jesus. And he says, this is what I'm looking for is the sort of attitudes that are godly and not an external show. So he wasn't looking for the sacrifice in itself, the physical sacrifice. He was looking for somebody who had the right spirit, the right attitude, exactly, a contrite heart. Mm -hmm. You know, that reminds me of a passage that's in Micah that ties in with this also. Micah chapter 6, and in beginning at verse 6, it says, Wherefore shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for my sin of my soul? And then it goes on in verse 8 and it gives us the answer. He says, For he hath shown thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. Mm -hmm. And that walking humbly is that broken spirit, that contrite spirit that you're talking about back in Psalm 51. Mm -hmm. And it's also the same sort of spirit that's going to admit freely to being sinful and acknowledge to God. You know, it's interesting we're talking about spirit. Back in Psalm 51, it uses that word over and over again. You know, you talk about Bible echoes, even sometimes within its own chapter, mm 
or own psalm, it could use a word over and over again. Verse 10, it says, Create within me a clean heart, and renew within me a right spirit, and cast not away, cast me not away from thy presence, and take not away thy Holy Spirit from me, but restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. So that's repeated over and over again in this same book. Do you know there's, there's an interesting point there, Steve? Verse 10 says, renew a right spirit within me. Mm -hmm. Now, my margin gives that as a constant spirit. Now, we know David was fantastically spiritual at times. He's got 2 Samuel 7, he has the promises. And he's, he's a wonderful psalmist, and he's very close to God. He, he sings praises to him. He loved God. God loved him. And yet, he still failed. And what he requests from God, or what he's striving for, is this constant spirit. He doesn't want to be up here one day and then down here the next day. Peaks and valleys. Exactly. Yeah. He wants his spiritual life to be a, a, a high all the time, and that's what he's striving for. Mm -hmm. But you know what? In this psalm, he doesn't actually state that he ever gets forgiveness. It's just a blueprint of how to request it. And I think we have to go outside of it to, to get the experience of the man who is forgiven. Well, we assume he was forgiven because of the promises mm -hmm. made to him in 2 Samuel, as you alluded to. But is there a place we can go to to see that he was forgiven? Yeah, Psalm 32 is the most clear. And the first verse there. Uh, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Uh, very good. Now, it talks about our sin being covered. How is it that our sin is covered, though? Well, I think that takes us back to Romans, where we think about the blood of the Lord Jesus. Uh, so it's the shedding of the blood for the remission of sins, and that which the Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross, which is for the remission of sins of those who would follow, and for those in the past as well, mm -hmm. who were looking forward to the coming Messiah. So this is something that we need to deal with on a daily basis. It's not just something, you know, well, I've done it once. You know, it talks about in Psalm 51, I've washed me thoroughly, and we think about baptism. But just because I've been baptized doesn't mean I stop sinning. Mm -hmm. So it's an ongoing process. Yeah. And I think if we were to look at other passages, we'd find this idea of being washed in the Lord Jesus' blood even, which is an unusual sort of idea. But here we have the opportunity to be cleansed throughly and to the inmost thought of our very hearts where we could be so secretive. That's amazing. I want to thank you for sharing these thoughts with us today. It has truly been enlightening, and I appreciate your coming all the way over here to be with us to share these things. It is an amazing thing that God has prepared a covering for our sins in the Lord Jesus Christ and that we have such a wonderful way of being able to have access to God through the Lord Jesus Christ who is seated at his right hand and that through the shedding of his blood on the cross that we might have the remission of sins. I would like to close with this one thought from Romans 6 and 23. For there Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death but that the gift of God is life eternal through Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for sharing this time with us and hope that this has been spiritually uplifting for you and that you will stay tuned for further information about these kinds of subjects on pamphlets. And join us again for another episode of This Is Your Bible Today. Thank you very much. For pamphlets and articles on this subject and other Bible subjects, go to www.thisisyourbible.com Click on the Library tab and select from Basic Bible Teaching, Bible Study, Doctrine, Life, Prophecy, The Christadelphians. In addition to our library, ThisIsYourBible.com offers online Bible study courses and Bible answers to your questions. Select www.thisisyourbible.com to increase your understanding of God's Word and learn about his future kingdom on the earth.